profile as a youth bulge. The theory contends that societies with rapidly growing young populations often end up with rampant unemployment and large pools of disaffected youth who are more susceptible to recruitment into rebel or terrorist groups. Countries with weak political institutions are most vulnerable to youth bulge related violence and social unrest. In contrast to this perspective, the African Union's African Youth Charter states that Africa's youth is the biggest resource and Africa's growing young population offers enormous potential. Improvements in health and education on the continent put Africa's youth in a more advantageous position than the generations before, offering them better conditions for advancing human capital. Uh, I don't believe that it's rocket science to figure out how to deal with a burgeoning uh, youth population. Uh, I think young people are the same all over the world, which means young people need education and opportunities. Um, some would say in many poor communities in the United States, we have a youth bulge too. Uh, and I have found when I first started uh, in Congress and would travel to Africa, a lot of similarities between the inner city and youth in uh, Africa, in the inner city areas where people feel there's not an economic opportunity, the education system is poor, um, really little access to transportation and jobs, then surprise, surprise, what happens? In the United States, our way of dealing with that, though, has been a contributing factor to mass incarceration. If you look at who is in prison in the United States, uh, you will talk about poor people, young people uh, of color. So I don't like the perspective that sees a youth bulge as being a problem and something that's very negative. And in many uh, situations in talking about Africa, young people are almost to blame for the youth bulge, which is kind of funny. Uh, we're left asking, what should we do with these potential destabilizers? Or what about the responsibility of the leaders? We do have leaders in office for 15, 20, 30 years or longer. We have leaders that are manipulating their constitutions, rigging elections, jailing the potential opposition or activists to stay in office. Uh, in the face of democratic backsliding, I've been impressed by the pro-democracy activists across the continent who nonviolently protest and risk their lives for political change. Because uh, ironically, you will talk about youth as being a problem, but historically, young people have always been at the forefront of positive social change. And uh, I, don't th I think Africa is no uh, exception to that. Uh, we saw this most recently in Sudan during the citizen uprising that pushed for a civilian-led transitional government after 30 years of autocratic and dictatorial rule. But there are other examples, including Nigeria's Not Too Young to Run campaign, which, sought, which seeks to reduce the age limit for running for elected office in Nigeria. There was Lucha in DRC, in Burkina Faso and Senegal, among many, many others. I cite these examples to show uh, again, just to verify that I believe that young people are the drivers of nonviolent political and social change. Um, I was recently in Darfur meeting with a group of young activists who played a significant role in Sudan's transition, and it was interesting talking to them because uh, they had strong opinions about the leadership, but yet at the same time they didn't see themselves participating in the leadership. They saw themselves as standing on the outside. And so we tried to uh, encourage them to uh, actually be a part of the process and not just be an outside uh, critic, but to in fact uh, run for office. Uh, my colleagues and I here in Congress know that it's in the best interest of the United States for the African continent to be strong. And for the African continent to be strong, we need to do whatever is necessary to make, the young, make sure that young people have opportunities and that African countries stabilize and thrive. I now recognize the ranking member for the purpose of making an opening statement. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'll be brief because we will have some votes uh, very shortly. Um, I want to thank you for convening this very important hearing. Uh, Africa, as we all know, is a continent of great hope and extraordinary promise. Unlike Western Europe, especially China and countries of East Asia, and indeed our own country, where we see demographic decline in aging populations in Africa, we see youthfulness and opportunity. True, there are many countervailing winds with which Africa and its youth must contend, many challenges, war, disease, tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, extremism, and corruption, but all too often there is a focus on these negative factors without looking at the enormous positive things that are happening on the subcontinent. Africa is a faith-based continent. I've had the privilege of meeting with many faith leaders in Africa, Christian, Muslim, traditional, and I always walk away impressed on how much the faith of the average African uh, sustains them and gives them hope for the future. You know, it says in the Old Testament, without 
uh, faith. Without, there is no hope. And I believe that. And we see it on uh, how they, people of Africa do carry themselves. It, it is extraordinary. I very much look forward to hearing today's testimony and also welcome back an old friend, Mr. Dagala, uh, who worked on this subcommittee when I was chairman. And thank you for your service then as well as now. And welcome the other witnesses as well. Yield back. Thank you. Well, we are uh, going to move forward and hear from the witnesses. And just so you know, we have been told votes could be called between 1020 and 1040, although we never really know. So we thought we would just forge ahead and see uh, how far we could get. Hopefully, we won't be interrupted, but we never know. Uh, Dr. Crystal Strong is an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania with faculty affiliations in the Departments of Anthropology and Africaner Studies. Dr. Strong holds a PhD in anthropology from UC Berkeley, like that. Her research and teaching focuses on youth, education, activism, new media, and popular culture in Africa and the African diaspora. She has 15 years of experience as an educator and scholar and is currently completing multiple research projects related to African youth. Makani Tangara currently runs a youth leadership, a leadership capacity building program for emerging as African leaders. Previously, Ms. Tangara was the senior director for program development at TechnoServe in Washington, DC. In this role, she managed the development of strategic bids, led donor engagement with the Gates Foundation, the Department of Agriculture, and UK Department for International Development, and supported program development capacity building. She has expertise on subjects including public-private partnerships, SME development, market systems development, food security, and job creation. Tiri Kandangala is a founder of uh, Accountable Africa, a consulting firm that advises on African accountability efforts and management of African sovereign wealth. Doc, Mr. Dangala is a former senior advisor for Africa at the U.S. House Committee on Foreign Affairs under the leadership of Mr. Smith. Prior to working in Congress, he co-chaired forums on accountability with, Dr., with David Walker, former U.S. Comptroller General and former CEO of the U.S. Government Accountability Office. We'll take your testimony now, ask that you speak for five minutes, and uh, we do have your full testimony. You can summarize. Dr. Strong. Distinguished Chair, Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee. In 30 years, one quarter of the world's youth population will live in Africa. The future of Africa is tied to whether this population is able to transition into sustainable livelihoods and societal roles in which youth are valued and supported. Over the past 15 years, I've studied the leadership and activism of youth across the continent. I've personally engaged with hundreds of youth in Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, and Kenya learning about the challenges they face in, the per in their perspectives on what is needed to bring transformation to their communities. An overwhelming source of frustration youth express was the gap in power between youth and elder leaders in the workplace, schools, and especially in government. Though youth under the age of 30 make up 70% of Africa's population, the average age of leaders is 70 years old. Fred Swanaker, co-founder of the African Leadership Academy, describes the current generation of African youth as the generation that will fix what past leaders have broken. My research experiences affirm this as a tangible possibility if youth are given the social supports they need. I have found that youth are not waiting for political leaders to hand over power in order to assume leadership roles. On the contrary, youth are taking on the work that governments and social institutions are meant to do without adequate resources, but with great creativity. I would like to highlight two contexts where we can see progressive youth leadership emerging, organized student politics and civic protest, and youth leadership development in initiatives. First, organized student politics and civic protest. In 2010, I researched organized student politics at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria's flagship university, after the end of decades of military rule. I studied the effect that the opening of student leadership opportunities had on this first cohort of youth to grow up under democracy. I found that with the opportunity to engage in student politics, students began to see themselves as political actors and to imagine future careers in public service. Student leaders devised ambitious projects to improve school conditions, such as buying a generator for the library so that students would have electricity to study during frequent campus blackouts, and providing Wi-Fi access to residents of a dormitory in the absence of stable internet service on campus. 
We see here that student leaders are taking the initiative to provide basic necessities that in other contexts would be provided by the government. Yet in most cases, student leaders were unable to execute such goals because they lacked access to resources and because, student authorities, because school authorities are often hostile to student leadership. When students spoke out against school authorities or engaged in peaceful protest about these conditions, they were met with disciplinary punishment and even expulsion. Witnessing Nigerian students engage in protest in response to school conditions and government inaction prompted me to research the causes of school protests in other African countries. After studying 1,100 incidents of school protests that have occurred since 2000, I've learned that most protests are caused by infrastructural issues like lack of water and electricity and by policies that negatively affect students such as tuition fee hikes. Similar to organized student politics, these civic protests have long-term positive effects on youth. Participation teaches youth how to articulate demands for societal changes and affirms their agency in seeing to it that such changes are implemented. These activities show that schools are rare social institutions where youth have opportunities to gain practical experience in leadership and representative governance. And the second context where progressive youth leadership is developing is youth leadership development initiatives. Many of the Nigerian students I formed relationships with have participated increasingly in international leadership development programs designed to support African youth. One graduate, Timmy Olagunju, was part of the 2015 cohort of the Mandela Washington program within the Young African Leadership Initiative established under President Obama. After the program, Timmy wrote a book entitled Yes, Africa Can, which describes his Yali experience. And when Timmy returned to Nigeria, he helped lead a campaign called Not Too Young to Run, which advocated for lowering the age limit for elected office. And in 2019, Tim ran, Timmy ran unsuccessfully for the Federal House of Representatives of the Young Nigerians Party. This is one person's experience, but we have identified 250 other such programs that support African youth leadership globally. I've emphasized these activities that illustrate grassroots youth leadership because they offer a rubric for meaningfully and respectfully shifting our approaches towards Africa in ways that will benefit youth. My recommendations are that we better engage with young people where they are already socially and politically engaged and that we leverage relationships with African governments to persuade current leaders to, to create youth-centered policies and leadership opportunities. This can be accomplished with three approaches. Yes, first, expand educational and leadership opportunities in the United States. The recent increase that we have seen in travel restrictions for Nigerians, Eritreans, and citizens of other African countries undermines young people's ability to take advantage of such opportunities. Lifting these restrictions is a needed step. Second, support youth leadership development in, in African countries themselves. And finally, pressure leaders to create youth-centered policies and leadership opportunities. I thank, thank you. you for the opportunity to speak and look forward to offering more context in the Q&A. Thank you, I appreciate that. And um, since we don't have a clock here, I didn't realize that, I'll do like this when you have a minute left, okay? Ms. Tungara. Thank you, Chairwoman Bass, Ranking Member Smith, and members of the subcommittee for providing the opportunity to address the panel on the Youth Bulge in Africa. In my current work, I run a leadership development program that provides training for 200 emerging African leaders from 45 countries. I see every day the incredible challenges they face to start and grow businesses, advocate for change, and invest in their community's children. I am proud to represent them and their needs in today's testimony. Moreover, as the child of an African-American mother and Ivorian father, I've had the privilege of living in both West Africa and the United States while working on issues of economic development and business growth. I'm passionate about promoting policies that uplift this generation of young people and unleash their innovation and creativity. By 2030, one quarter of the world's total under 25 population will be in Africa. African youth are global change makers. They will ensure that the African continent fulfills its potential to lift its citizens out of poverty and power the global economy. But for that to happen, those who care about a stable Africa must coordinate their investment in today's youth. Key challenges facing them include access to education, workforce development, and job creation. And policies targeted at promoting education 
supporting the small and medium enterprise sector, the SME sector, growing the digital economy and growing trade will have positive impacts on young people, but also support access to African goods for American consumers and create larger markets for US exports. First, I'd like to focus on the education piece. Across the continent, the capacity of educational systems to educate young people does not meet demand. Millions have had their education cut short by lack of access, financial challenges, and civil conflict. Separately, there are very educated youth unable to find formal jobs. For some, their skills do not align with labor demand, which a challenge exacerbated by lack of access to STEM education and digital skills. And for others, highly prized government jobs just are not available. As a result, there's a need to invest in educational systems that open opportunities for entrepreneurship, entry into skilled trades, and entry into the digital economy. Complementing technical and vocational training with personal and professional effectiveness training, otherwise known as soft skills training, is a powerful way to increase the impact of programs already taking place because they create greater confidence by young people in their ability to engage the marketplace. Shifting to a focus on the SME sector, it's worth noting that 75% of new entrants to the labor market will work in self-employment or in microenterprise. U.S. foreign policy already contributes to the development of formal private sector jobs by creating opportunities for U.S. companies to do more business on the continent. Nonetheless, we can do more to address the African SME sector that is populated by young entrepreneurs, support supply chain connections between urban, urban and rural areas, and particularly to rural farmers, and drives income generation. The solutions that are working involve bringing technical knowledge together with local expertise to develop approaches appropriately tailored and targeted to the needs of young people in their national context. And public-private partnerships are one way of doing this effectively. In light of this, I have four policy recommendations. First, leverage Peace Corps to channel US expertise on STEM education, the digital economy, and soft skills training into the networks of youth-focused organizations on the continent. Second, continue to support public-private partnerships that bring knowledge and expertise and market access to African communities and youth-led enterprises and particularly through uh, the USAID Global Development Alliance program. Third, leverage US programming to center youth engagement more broadly. They want to influence their governments, but they also want to influence the programming that's happening in their communities. And fourth, adapt the lessons learned from the Small Business Administration to help build the capacity of African institutions and organizations supporting SMEs on the continent. Going forward, U.S. policy towards Africa needs to take the long view and not be subject to short-term political whims. The Chinese have been effective in positioning themselves as investment partners to African governments through their persistent presence and a strategy that engages the private sector, local communities, and governments. The U.S. response to this dynamic should be to lean into the competition. A strong reservoir of goodwill exists towards the United States among young leaders in Africa. We can tap into that enthusiasm to ensure that American businesses, goods, and services are part of the economic fabric of a competitive African economy, one led by its youth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ndangala. Good morning, and thank you again. Um, Chairwoman Bass, Ranking Member Smith, uh, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify on the youth bulge in Africa and considerations for U.S. policy. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the work of Dr. Jack uh, Goldstone of George Mason University. Uh, he actually coined the term youth bulge. Um, he, he's been a resource to me over, for over a decade and uh, others as we've uh, mostly been working with corporations and U.S. investors who want to understand the demographic uh, shift happening in Africa. Um, what's important, you know, I don't want to oversimplify the term youth bulge, but I kind of compare it to, uh, when I s explained it to investors and businesses that want to install themselves in Africa, I compare it to the, to the North Atlantic current, you know, a sort of wind. You know, it's, it's a force of nature, really, what is happening in Africa. It's a force of nature that any serious actor must take into account. Um, you know, from pi when you think of the North Atlantic uh, winds, you know, it's um, pilots and sailors, they, they account for where the wind is blowing uh, and adjust course accordingly. I hope that my testimony and even the testimony of uh, these other witnesses will help U.S. policy adjust accordingly too. Um, the, Africa has, has the potential to be important for 
investors today and investors and businesses and entrepreneurs for a different reason that it has been important in the past. Um, the, uh, the demographic winds that are blowing in Africa or, or you know, the demographic change of the youth population can actually be harnessed if, if it is harnessed correctly, Africa is poised to become one of the largest consumer markets in the world and even an engine of global economic growth. This means that if I'm an investor or a business and I'm looking for the next sales destination you know, for my American goods, I'm increasingly looking to Africa. This shift is important because rather than just you know, having investors value Africa for its raw materials and resources, they can now value Africa for, you know, uh, for being a traditional or a trading partner uh, first. Companies like Apple, you know, what does this mean? It means that companies like Apple won't be looking at the Congo as just a source for coltan and cobalt, but actually a sales hub for its products. This means that Apple will now consider the standard of living of Congolese consumers as an in integral part of their um, profit-making equation. Uh, you know, <coughs> NBA Africa, I did, to continue along the co corporate uh, perspective, NBA Africa is actually evidence of this shift in thinking towards the continent. Um, you know, Africa for a long time has been a source of young talent for the NBA. I mean, just watch the finals and you'll see a whole bunch of young African uh, um, uh, players. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's now becoming, it has the potential to become a profit center for the NBA. This means they can build stadiums, sell tickets, and bring more advertising there. Um, it's, and so this is evidence of the shift that's happening. Um, it's not an easy shift. You know, because, um, you know, you need to protect purchasing power. There's a lot of growth that needs to happen for it to be a, the, that final, de that large destination for consumer goods. But, you know, it, this is why this hearing is important and, and, you know, for U.S. policymakers to get it right and African leaders to pay attention to this wind, um, we can encourage this transition um, to be... Uh, uh, to be to harness the win the winds of uh, this demographic change, you know, if it if it is not harnessed correctly, this is where, uh, and I really appreciated Chairwin Ter Bass's comment that it, this is where, you know, it turns into a, ne a negative. I mean, it doesn't have to. Um, so what we what we must do to prevent uh, these forces from becoming a negative, we must prevent the youth bulge from aligning with. Um, uh, from aligning with disenfranchisement and the despair that a lot of youth have. Um, I'm, as I'm closing my remarks, I wanted, I wanted to mention, um, uh, you know, I was in Senegal on vacation with my wife uh, over the holidays. My wife is Senegalese. And we had a driver, and he was explaining to us the predicament of his son. His son finished with an engineering degree, and he was explaining how, you know, his son had, you know, uh, he was um, discouraged because he couldn't find a job for, for years, actually. And he, in French, he said, I'm mort vivant, which means uh, a kind of a zombie, you know. And it's this despair that we have to prevent the youth bulge from coupling with, because this is what drives, you know, uh, delinquent activities. Even here in the U.S., it's the same case. But, uh, uh, you know, to prevent this from becoming negative, uh, negative trend, I want to conclude my remarks by saying, um, by uh, by giving one recommendation, um, and this recommendation is for, uh, you know, U.S. policy to empower African countries and even regional bodies to protect themselves. Why do I say that? Is because African youth are the most vulnerable, and require strong institutions and effective governments to cultivate and nurture and protect their. Uh, economic potential. Um, you know, youth are the first to suffer when governments and institutions are weak and inept. Africa's most vulnerable are, uh, are preyed upon when Africa is not capable to protect itself. So U.S. policy should work towards positioning Africa to protect itself militarily and also economically. And so these are, there's two ways that this could happen. One, uh, uh, just, uh, just to get through the two ways, is one is the um, uh, if the U.S. could, uh, if we could hold hearings to reconsider U.S. opposition to the African Union 0.2% uh, levy that allows it to self-finance and take care of itself. And the second one is um, the uh, African continental free trade area is, uh, should have a component to um, uh, protect the economic potential of youth. So uh, thank you again thank for you. this. And we'll have more time you know, for discussion, but I want to go ahead and begin uh, questioning, and I I'll ask my questions last so my colleagues have an opportunity, especially since this is a fly-out day. 
Um, we'll ask questions for five minutes. Everybody gets five minutes, and then if you want a second round, we'll do a second round. So I will um, go to my Madam ranking Chair, member. thank you very much. And again, thanks for calling this important hearing. Uh, Mr. Dungali, uh, you really emphasize the importance of tackling the unemployment issue, uh, and I think um, one of your comments uh, about the, uh, if we don't encourage Africa's transition to becoming the next largest consumer market in the world, the force of the youth bulge will likely turn Africa into the world's main conflict zone. That is very, an ominous warning about if we don't do what we can do to help uh, encourage that youth uh, employment. Um, you also point out Chinese investors displace local labor. Maybe you want to speak to that issue. I thought your comment about, <clears throat> and all of your testimonies are fantastic, uh, but it, there's only five minutes. Uh, your comment about being in Senegal and, um, you know, that the impact of not, you know, having the training but not being able to find that job and, and how discouraging uh, that truly is to that, that, that young man that you uh, spoke about uh, having spoken to his father. Um, if you could speak to those issues, um, I'd appreciate it, and um, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on the 0.02% um, levy. I mean, that's one of your two recommendations. Uh, and then when you talk about free trade, um, you know, we have a few things like AGOA, but that's very limited, but it's very important. Uh, we just had the U.S., Canada, Mexico free trade agreement, which I think is the best trade agreement I have ever seen. When the AFL-CIO and the Chamber of Commerce both agree to it, um, it's historic. Uh, it has labor rights, environmental protections, and I voted against NAFTA and held several hearings when NAFTA was being considered, uh, and it had none of those things. It had admonishments, it had, you know, feckless language that did not do any of that. This one has all of that, so hopefully that could become a, a, a model for an Africa, you know, a greater Africa, Pan-Africa free trade agreement, please. Uh, Ranking Member Smith, thank you for the question. Um, yes, to start on the free trade and the economic potential, you know, I think uh, what's very interesting, so, you know, uh, um, Dr. Strong mentioned about uh, some, or actually, you know, Ms. Tsongar mentioned about the Chinese investment. Um, you know, when when uh, a lot of foreign investors, when they come into Africa, they can they can displace actually the economic opportunities for the local youth. So this is where uh, trade agreements should have these sorts of protections. And, and in my recommendations, I recommended even, you know, here in the U.S. we have the CFIUS, which is the Committee for uh, fi um, Foreign Investment in the U.S. We actually review foreign capital coming into the U.S., making sure that, does, you know, for national security purposes that they're not buying. Africa sh African bodies should ha have these sorts of review committees that are seeing the capital that's coming in. Is it actually achieving, is it not, okay, yes, it's, you're building a bridge here and you're doing this and that, but are you doing it the right way? Are you uh, affecting uh, our youth, our local youth? So th th this is the sort of um, uh, policy that, that uh, we should encourage uh, to happen in, in the region. Um, on the 0.2% levy, um, I, I think, I believe it was, two, uh, it was uh, 2015 or 16 that the U.S. government opposed, um, uh, opposed the 0.2% uh, uh, levy for this African Union to self-finance. The reason was about uh, WTO rules. But really, I mean, this is something that can be negotiated because if Africa's going to be the next largest destination for consumer goods, and also, if we want Africa to, 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 to be self-sustaining, protect itself, even fund the Sahel, it needs to have its own way to finance itself. So we, uh, even holding a hearing as to what are the workable solutions for the U.S. to support the self-sustaining would be good. And then thank you again for that comment on despair. You know, um, we stay in touch with our, with our driver. And this is very important because the human component of this, you know, the dignity of working is so important. You know, these young, and I, I hate to make it a young man issue, but a lot of them are the ones that go and join these militia groups. These young men, because they don't have the money to buy dowry, to buy a wife, or to pay for health care, you know, they, they feel like they are not, you know, uh, not fulfilling a stage in their adulthood, in their, in, their, in their manhood even. And this is what even becomes the human force behind a lot of the conflict. So if we could address some of that, it would be very, uh, if policy could address some of that, it would be very helpful. Trade being emphasized, some people say trade, not aid. I think we need to provide the aid, you know, particularly on the humanitarian basis, but um, Africa is poised to matriculate into the biggest market uh, in the world, as you indicated. And I think I'm the only baby boomer sitting on this uh, panel. No, you're not. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that whole group in our country certainly led 
to an unprecedented building of homes and home ownership. Um, and it's, of course, it's still ongoing and we are still growing as an economy. So I want to, you know, thank you for, for your testimony. Thank all three of you for your wonderful testimonies. You're back. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member and other baby boomer. Uh, and, and I hope they don't use a dowry to buy a wife. That would kind of sound terrible. Um, and I hope as we're having this discussion, we think about um, gangs in inner city areas. Uh, Ms. Houlihan? My questions are largely about uh, women and girls and their health and making sure that we're addressing those particular, uh, that particular population and, and primarily for Dr. Strong. My first question is, um, complications from pregnancy and childbirth are the leading cause of death uh, in adolescent girls 15 to 19 and it's obviously especially concerning in Africa. So thinking about the potential of young African women, I just wanted to know that we are uh, supporting the, the health and rights and ensuring that girls can remain in school. How can the U.S. best support those goals? Can you give us some concrete examples of how we can be more helpful for that 15 to 19 year old uh, w young woman population? Um, I'm afraid that uh, 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 committee member Houlihan that um, that's a bit outside of my expertise in terms of reproductive issues. However, um, what I've seen in my work around education and girls' access to education is that there is a transformative um, quality and experience of attending school. Um, in Nigeria and in many other parts of the continent, girls' education is highly politicized and restricted. Um, if we think about the incident in 2014 with the kidnapping of hundreds of schoolgirls in Chibok in northern Nigeria, I think that gives us um, an understanding of the political and humanitarian stakes of restricting access to girls' education. Um, and what I have seen um, outside of the reproductive realm is the ways that um, young women are given access to leadership, development, um, through education, through organized student politics, and these should be expanded as one access of um, the empowerment of girls and young women. Thank you, and my next question is for Mr. Is it Dongala? Hi. Uh, the Sahel is simultaneously experiencing a severe refugee crisis and a spike in extremism. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees made an emergency dec declaration for Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger as millions are fleeing from their homes. And according to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, there has been a rapid expansion of extremist attacks. How can we better engage the young people, young women in particular, in this re region as part of our counterterrorism efforts? I guess if you can probably tell, my angle is on women uh, and empowering women. Uh, for a little bit of background on me, I sit on this committee, but I also serve, serve on arm, armed services as well. Uh, and I really am very intrigued by empowering women in particular to be part of the solution uh, to extremism and extreme violence. I, I can think of, um, I was recently in, in Ethi thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Um, I was re recently in Ethiopia, and I can think of, uh, you know, Ethiopia is one of the biggest uh, contributors to peacekeepers, and uh, they have a lot of, they have women, uh, like they have a lot of women in the military, actually. And, you know, one component that we're not looking at when we're looking at the Sahel is, yes, is the role that women can play. Um, a lot of, in a lot of these communities, w uh, women, if, you know, they're not, they're not as much combatants, but they are the ones that hold the communities together. Um, um, I think, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Strong said, you know, um, we need to encourage our, uh, some of our African counterparts, uh, uh, governments to um, consider ways to um, see women as assets in the field. Um, uh, one particular organization that I know that I was uh, working with in, in Ethiopia, they were working with... Um, uh, the um, menstrual cups uh, that you're washing and re reusing. And when she was trying to educate the health ministry, they were like, oh, no, our, our women are, they don't need that, you know. They, and, and so it, they weren't seeing some of the needs of, the, uh, of, of women as, as even kind of as co-equals. Co and so um, on, that, on that note, um, I just wanted to also say that it's from the Sahel uh, terrorism part. Youth are, um, it's, an employment is just as important as military. Absolutely. Did I, is that a minute or am I out of time? 
Uh, and at, with my last kind of minute, if I could ask a little bit more about your personal experience or your professional experience with the influence of China in, in Africa, particularly in terms of taking away or potentially taking away uh, jobs from uh, Africans. Is there some experience that you can reflect on that would be helpful as well to this committee? So um, I think the, a lot of Chinese contractors uh, contract to bring their own employees from China um, because they have a certain way of working and a workforce that they're wanting to engage with to do that work. Um, ideally, in those negotiations, um, when governments are making those negotiations, they need to negotiate to ensure that Africans are also getting a certain amount of employment out of those contracts. So it's, I think, more of a situation of, um, you know, the Chinese are very present uh, across the continent. They're already there, they're working, they're finding deals, and they're, and they're being sort of aggressive in pursuing opportunities. And I think where we want to support African workers is in supporting the governments, first of all, to understand the universe of options that are negotiable uh, when it comes to these deals, whether they're talking about with the Chinese or Middle Eastern partners or European partners, frankly. Um, this is about empowering the ability to negotiate on behalf of their populations and ensure that the knowledge transfer happens so that African um, subcontractors get some of those contracts and their employees get the benefits and that Africans are working and learning how to also do this kind of work in their own communities. Thank you. Uh, in, inner city America, in inner city America, we fight for local hire because lots of times in areas with high unemployment, the people that are working do not reflect the folks that live there. Mr. Burchett, it's your turn. Thank you, Chair Lady, and thank you for foregoing your questions. I always enjoy your questions a lot more than mine, so uh, I, I appreciate you doing that, though. And thank you all for being here. Um, right, I'm, I'm an odd person. You can ask anybody up here. I'm, I'm really into bamboo. I make bamboo skateboards and all kinds of crazy stuff out of bamboo, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's like God's carbon fiber. But in Africa, they make bamboo bicycles. Try to do that here, but the bamboo's not, not native. It's uh, there's called an iron bamboo, I believe is the species. There's over a thousand species of bamboo, oddly enough. But the ones that are native to Africa are the ones that are conducive to making that. And there's people that are making that over there, and some businessmen are over there doing it and teaching folks. And I'm concerned that folks are being taken advantage of because, you know, some poor fella or, or lady uh, doesn't, actually know the value of the American dollar or, or wherever the country of, of origin that these business people are coming in from. And I worry that, that they maybe don't pay them a decent wage. And what I would like to see is, is to teach the folks how to, how to start their own businesses and, and learn how to do that kind of thing. And then, I mean, that's generational. That's, that's what will change. change. And Because, too, when you go into these countries, the poor folks are, that's where – a lot of the bad people in this this world take advantage of them, and I, I don't dig that at all. But I guess um, the and I'm concerned also about the unemployment rates. Um, which countries do y'all feel like have made the most progress to create jobs, and which ones are lagging behind? You know, we always talk about Africa, and you, you know, that's a big country. And I go, no, I think it's a continent. But you know, go ahead, brother. I'm sorry. I, um, I, I have to review the numbers, but I can just go anecdotally, ba anecdotally based on the countries that I've been visiting. I'm, I'm really, I've been really impressed That's by Senegal. That's why we're in Congress. We make stuff up every day, brother, <laughs> so you just go right ahead. Um, I, I was recently, uh, when I was in Senegal, uh, so I, I was impressed by the, uh, the, the infrastructure investments that they've made because what they're doing is decongesting this, the urban centers, and that's actually a big problem because if you have a lot of youth, popu young, popu young people in cities that are underinvested, um, you know, um, there's overcapacity and that just makes room for conflict. So I think Senegal, they've done well in investing in the roads and building cities outside of the main city. Um, I don't know how that reflects too much on the unemployment rate. Um, also, I think Ethiopia, I think uh, Prime Minister Abiy is definitely tr trying to address um, unemployment, especially among um, the youth in Addis and Aromia, because if you look at where a lot of the protests and a lot of the conflicts are coming from, it's, you could overlap the two populations. And so, um, you know, idle hands are the devil's playing ground, right? That's what, you know, my, my grandma used to say. So, 
my mama say that many times. <laughs> so, so, you know, these sorts of things, uh, um, it's important. These are the numbers that are important to look, and you can also overlap them with the conflict zones. Uh, that's, that's your one minute. Man. One minute. Okay. Would any the rest of y'all like to address that? Go ahead, ma'am. Sure. I mean, I also, also anecdotally, um, you know, I think Rwanda has been uh, rewarded by having a very systematic uh, investment program to bring in um, dollars and to bring in uh, investors, and that has led to positive economic growth for them uh, recently. Another country that's done well at a high level um, has been Cote d'Ivoire, which has uh, achieved you know, 7, 8, 9 percent growth year on year through significant investment um, and also large uh, road construction programs and such that help create uh, jobs for a lot of people. Um, the challenge is that even in that context, people are still struggling and they're still hungry. Um, you know, in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, you know, the people say, uh, on ne mange pas pont, we can't eat the bridge that we just built, you know, we're still hungry. Um, and so even when there is significant uh, investment, even when things are good, the need is still there to, you know, try to create opportunities for entrepreneurship and other ways for people to gain income and support their families. Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Chairwoman Bass, and to, to our witnesses. Um, I'll confess I didn't think we'd be talking about bamboo bikes today, and that's why I love this job. I learn something new every day, and in fact, I already found a, a vendor on my, uh, my phone. Uh, sure. you know, I, I like to think that the youth bulge is uh, not just a challenge, but an opportunity. And as an entrepreneur myself, uh, I'm very focused on, on programs and initiatives and best practices relative to developing young entrepreneurs. Uh, Ms. Tungara, you referenced leveraging the Peace Corps for STEM training and public-private partnerships, uh, the SBA. I know we have the Prosper Africa and the AGOA programs. Uh, but if you could speak in, with a little bit more detail about uh, countries uh, and particularly initiatives, uh, whether they're our own or others, uh, that are really cultivating uh, small business development and entrepreneurship? Um, well, I think that um, there are a number of initiatives. The real challenge is scaling. Yeah. How do we actually get more people served? And how do we make access to services and information systematic? Uh, you know, one program that uh, I co-developed um, in my previous life um, was a program sponsored by the UK Department for National Development called Engine. Uh, which was meant to serve um, about a thousand small and medium enterprises in Ghana and support them to scale their their small businesses. Um, we're talking about a context where uh, entrepreneurs aren't seen as positively necessarily as people who have government jobs. So it's also about changing the culture of self-employment and valuing people who are engaged in self-employment and are creating formal and informal systems. Um, the way to channel those services um, is, and scale the channeling of those services is really the challenge. You have organizations like a TechnoServe or others who are good at service delivery, but they can only hit so many people. And so my policy prescriptions are about how do you create a more systemic fashion to work with both governmental and non-governmental institutions to standardize access to information and to be able to uh, get small businesses the information they need to, to scale. Um, actually, uh, there's a bamboo bike uh, manufacturer in Ghana yeah, just, that just participated in this engine program, oh. actually, uh, and that I know and came to visit the United States a couple of years ago. And um, oh, he is it called Boomers? Yes, okay. exactly. So um, you know, so and but he is working with other alumni of that program to create a small business alumni association that's advocating for policies that benefit small businesses because their interests are very different from a chamber of commerce, uh, and what they need is very different from what a chamber of commerce at, you know, that's advocating for larger businesses requires. And so I think by supporting the ability of these small entrepreneurs to come together and advocate to organize, and by supporting the sort of coterie and sort of infrastructure of organizations that are touching these small entrepreneurs, I think that can be effective in empowering people with the information they need to build their businesses, to change the culture around recognizing entrepreneurship as a legitimate uh, economic uh, trajectory, and to help them to then for scale their businesses and scale the jobs that they create. You know, I can't help but think it, it just it took me three seconds to find this you know, bamboo mic, mic maker in, in Ghana, and it, it just makes me wonder if there's a better way also to connect entrepreneurs and small businesses in Africa with American consumers. Uh, you know, it, that's, it took three seconds, uh, mm -hmm. but part of it is just how do you connect the dots, and uh, that's some food for thought. Uh, Mr. Dongala, any, any comments to on entrepreneurship? And, and I, I'm particularly focused on, I want to know countries that are, seem to be doing it better uh, or particular initiatives that seem to uh, be showing signs of success. 
Um, uh, the uh, the media, c- the country that I can think uh, that comes to mind is actually one that Ms. Tonga already mentioned. Rwanda is doing a really good job um, with their Rwanda, I think, Development Board, RDB. Okay. Um, and actually, there's a lady, uh, Clara Kamanzi, who, who leads it. Um, y- you know, she, she deals at a very high level, but uh, the, I was interested, I was, um, I was really impressed by the gra- granularity of how they think of, I think it takes like two days to open a business in Rwanda, which is, for Africa, it's, it's actually, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fast, you know? It takes about 200 days here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, and so um, they, they make it very, um, they're thinking about not only the big investors, but even the small investors and the small entrepreneurs. And this matters because when you, when you talk to the, the young people out there, they're actually, you know, they're interconnected. They have the social media. They see everybody doing that, and they want to participate in the global economy. Thank you. And Dr. Strong, any perspectives to share? Sure. I think my uh, colleagues have done a great job of pointing us to some really um, exciting possibilities. But uh, two things that I'd like to offer is that I think we can look at um, schools and educational institutions as sites where entrepreneurship and um, business you know, growing are also developed. Um, a lot of educational focus at the higher ed level is focused on universities, but polytechnics, vocational institutions have been um, systematically defunded over the years, and yet these are places where young people develop trade skills. Many of them run businesses while students without capital, and so these are opportunities to, in a sort of structured way, um, partner with and lend support to young people. Um, I'd also like to direct your attention to the African Leadership Academy in South Africa, which is a two-year high school, and part of what they do is they have students develop, um, they incubate businesses over the course of two years, and they have a micro um, economy within the school itself. The African Leadership Academy. Okay, thank you very much to all of you. Appreciate it. Mr. Smith? Madam Chair. You know, I see representatives of the African Development Foundation in the audience, Cliff Stammerman and Mark O'Neill. Cliff used to work on this committee as well years ago. Great to see you. And I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, uh, what can and what role could ADF, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, and the Development uh, Finance Corporation play in creating opportunity for African youth? What have they done and what more can they be doing uh, so that those jobs are created? Oh. I was um, recent. I was impressed at the amount of um, so the African Development uh, uh, Foundation actually does smaller grants, you know, around ten thousand uh, to fifty thousand. And I was actually impressed at the uh, parity that they have with women entrepreneurs and male entrepreneurs. They actually, if you look at their, I mean, I'd have to look again at the numbers. But last time I I, I was with uh, CD. Uh, the president of the uh, foundation, uh, and I was reviewing the numbers, they were investing in women, in young women entrepreneurs as much as they were in young men. And I think that matters a lot because if you go into Congo, Kinshasa, you'll notice that a lot of the commercials are women, you know, and, you know, and they, you know, they run the <laughs> the market economy. I mean, if you want to go to the market, I'd, I'd take my, my sister with me because, you know, she would help me get the best deal. And so, uh, I think the African Development Foundation is one of the few one of the, one of the few uh, American agencies that understands this nuance and is pushing the envelope in that regard. I think in terms of uh, U.S. agencies um, in general, there's an opportunity for them to talk more to each other um, and to share learnings. I mean, USAID is doing a lot of work on the ground. MCC is doing a lot of work on the ground. There are a lot of small lessons learned and out of all of that programming that could use some cross-fertilization uh, and learning. So, for example, um, you know, even in the MCC, um, I mentioned in my testimony the, uh, the program they're doing in Cote d'Ivoire that's supporting TVET. Uh, programming and building educational and secondary schools, um, they should be talking to USAID because they've also built schools. And even though that's an attempt to uh, do that in a separate marketplace, there are approaches that engage young people and make sure that their voices are heard as that programming is rolling out, ways to integrate and and ensure gender parity and make sure that women are well represented um, as both trainers and trainees in these programs, and to ensure that there is a feedback mechanism where people in these communities are able to talk directly back to the donor and not just you know, be so far away and just have the businesses interacting directly with us uh, in our programming. And so there are ways to have engagement from communities to ensure that programming is demand-led and that we're also sharing best practices across agencies. 
Finally, on one trip to the DR Congo, and to your point, Mr. Dengala, <clears throat> I'll never forget, it was in Kinshasa 20 years ago, and it was a big, big project, building project. So we went to it. I went with the State Department people, and I looked around and I said, where are the Africans? Where, where are the Congolese? They were all Chinese workers, and it was so oppressive. I think they may have been coerced labor, probably from the Lao Gai, uh, that were doing the work there. I can't, they thought that might be the case as well, but we couldn't prove it, but it was, no Africans. Feel back. Uh, let me, uh, I know we'll be called to votes um, soon, but I want to um, begin my questions kind of how I started by saying that when I first went to Africa and first learned about, you know, the so-called youth bulge, it just felt like home because we have this, some of these same issues. You can go to one community I represent called South Central Los Angeles you, that has a very, very high unemployment, and you see all kinds of people working, but they're not from the area. So in our communities here, when we have large unemployment in areas where people don't feel they have an economic opportunity, it's not surprising to see an overlay of gang issues. And so I don't think any of this is rocket science. We know how to solve these problems in the United States. We just choose not to, so young people are criminalized. Um, this situation is a little different on the African continent, but we do know how to solve these problems. It's a question of political will. And so I just want to cut to the chase and find out from you three very specifically, what can we do legislatively? I think YALI is a great program, so what do we need to do to strengthen YALI? What are the weaknesses and strengths of YALI? Uh, what kind of support can we provide to African countries um, in terms of leadership development, because you can, you can get a young person, uh, and I think, Dr. Strong, I, b I believe in your testimony, you talked about uh, programs that focused on leadership development, and you can direct people into politics, civil society, a variety of things that are positive. So I would like for you, for you each to give a specific legislative recommendations uh, votes have been called. There is just one vote, uh, but we, we have a few minutes before we all have to run. Dr. Strong? Thank you very much for that question. Um, so I talked in my um, testimony about three different areas that I think there are opportunities for legislative policies. You mentioned YALI. There's the Fulbright program, Tech Women. I think there's room for the U.S. to, ha to expand that to additional sectors to additional focus areas, um, particular initiatives that invite young people to um, come to the U.S. to, you know, benefit from the resources, the, you know, the skills, et cetera. Um, right now, many of these programs have quite a limited capacity, so if there is, um, a, you know, an opportunity to expand that and to include young people who may not be, um, the quote unquote best and the brightest. These programs tend to focus on people who are already um, relatively more exactly. educated, skilled. And so I think um, if there's a real interest here in um, being holistic, that we might think about ways to not target those who are already relatively more privileged. Um, additionally, with the YALI program, there are currently four leadership regional hubs. There's capacity to do more. Um, again, many of those focus on people who are already into careers, but if there was an effort to um, focus on primary schools, secondary schools, where we're seeing much less sort of capacity building around leadership development, I think that would be quite wise. Um, and additionally, you know, there is, I think, an important role that countries like the U.S. can play in leveraging our relationships with African governments to um, you know, persuade them to, um, number one, for example, not stay, overstay in office or, you know, change their constitution so that they can run for, you know, third terms, but also to ensure that there's youth representation in government, that things like not too young to run might have a chance of, of you know, taking on or getting taken up. Um, and I think those are my broad areas. Thank of you. Thank you. Ms. Tangala, Tangara. Um, so building on the, the regional hubs, we can't bring everybody here. I mean, the demand is just too high. And so I think there's an opportunity to expand on the regional hubs for YALI to ensure that 
more uh, people can get access to programming via those hubs, but that those hubs are structured to capacitate people to replicate the programming in their own communities. So it's not just enough to give a person training. Right. We should be empowering those people to replicate and to go out and to do more. Um, and so uh, Dr. Strong mentioned the African Leadership Academy. The founders of that, I mean, their goal when they're educating folks through their learning programs is for those folks to go out and educate more programs, right. make more people, and establish new educational institutions across the continent. And so I think the approach to this programming can't just be to train one person. It's to train one person to train 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that you get Africans shaping the agenda in their own countries and shaping the training of their future generations. You think there's enough organizations in Africa that instead of us funding our own organizations to do that, we can fund African organizations? Absolutely. And then maybe you could give us a list of names of those countries that, I mean companies, con uh, organizations, you know, NGOs that we can directly fund. That's how you, that doesn't work. So I will say absolutely yes with <laughs> one caveat, right? When we give money to organizations, the standards of procurement, the, the, the internal regulatory systems and processes that they need to have to respond to reporting and the financial reporting, some, they're lacking. And so when we give this money, we also have to be willing to build their capacity to yes. meet our reporting needs. Um, because it's not just enough to say, oh, here's the bar, you have to jump this bar to get our funding. So there is an ecosystem there where we can channel those funds, but we have to be willing to support the buildup of their internal infrastructure to be able to receive those funds Another as well. Another example that's consistent with here. Yes. And I, I just want to second Ms. Tangar's uh, um, uh, comments. Um, you know, YALI is, is a great program, but we need to make sure that it becomes an internalized program. It's right. uh, more organic. Um, and, uh, and that's a, a good general statement, but I'll ask you later to be specific about okay. that. Okay. I know we fund a major contractor here yes. that goes and does YALI, but yes. how do we move it so that it becomes African? Be Yes. More specifically, I think an organization that's a, if it was in a position financially better, the African Union could actually execute it, should have a component or a parallel component to the uh, YALI. So in that segue, something specifically, again, is some, I bring up the 0.2% levy. If legislatively yeah. we could talk to the, uh, we could encourage the U.S. Trade Representative to reconsider. Why do we have that? Hmm? Why do we have that 2% uh, levy? Uh, well, th so the African Union wants to have a 0.2% levy on imports. Um, it, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a, under a WTO o rules, it could qualify as a protective measure. Oh, I see. Right? Okay. But right. if we're talking about youth, mm -hmm. youth need protection. They're the most vulnerable. And so Africa needs to figure out how it's going to incubate and nurture and protect the youth uh, uh, economic potential in the region. And, and the reason why the 0.2% matters is because it gives Africa, the African Union capacity, when we're talking about capacity building, to actually act and, and do it. And so, um, you know, I think if, we, if there were more accountability measures, maybe to give other people more confidence that this sort of self-funding measures would, um, would go towards what we think it will. But um, again, that's one thing that I would stress. I think it uh, goes a long way into building the capacity to nurture, um, invest, and protect the, the, the youth of the region. Thank you. Any closing comments that any of you have? We could start back with Dr. Strong. Thank you very much once again um, for the opportunity to advocate for youth here. Um, so I think I'd just like to echo what I've said all along, which is that I think you know there is a, a very needed focus on jobs and unemployment and you know economic development. Um, but I think education cannot be left out of these conversations. And the way I tend to think about education is not just about knowledge growing and learning, but schools are such important historically and certainly in the current moment institutions where young people are learning what it means to be a citizen, where they're developing political identities, where they are learning the extent to which their governments and societies will support them. And I think in expanding opportunities and supporting um, ways of growing and developing institutions to be more receptive to young people's leadership, that will go a very long way in ensuring that youth, when they become adults, when they move on into positions of leadership within their societies, that they're equipped with the tools to do so in a way that's transformative. Okay, I think we better conclude. Um, thank you very much for the time. Appreciate it very much, and I uh, want to continue with your recommendations. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I love
hear a statement. They're, they're very good. Yeah. Right? <laughs> 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 Pepper's a question. 